Good morning and welcome. Welcome Southside Bible Church. Welcome to anyone who may be visiting with us this morning. We are grateful to have you here with us. At the close of our service today, we're going to announce new members, as was said, uh, with COVID. It's been a little tough to keep up with all the admin on all this. So if your name is not mentioned, and it should have, uh, it was an administrative mistake, and you're still loved, you're still desired to be a part of this church, let us know and we will get it corrected. Um, New members class finishes next week, and our goal then will be on every communion Sunday to bring on uh, new members. And so that'll be the procedure as we march forward. One of my favorite hymns, Rise Up, O Church of God, and Be Done with Lesser Things. Uh, I've never seen clearer from Scripture and experienced the beauty and the design of the local body, the church of God. It's a necessity and it's a blessing to us. What we're currently studying in Romans 7 this morning, we'll finish up. It just screams that the deceitfulness of sin is great. And we need God and we need His Spirit and we need the Son. We need uh, Scriptures and the body to help us uh, to make it to the end. And so I pray that you see the beauty of the body of Christ and we give ourselves to his bride. And so let's go before God and we will pray and we will open up Romans 7 this morning. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it's inspired, it's inerrant, it's perfect. And we open up the very mind of God this morning. And so I pray, Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Illuminate this. God, let us know it deeply in our minds and our hearts and be worked out into life. God, we want to walk as Christ walked. We want to put you on display and glorify you by our excellent behavior. And so God, continue to use that word in your spirit this morning in each and every heart. There are needs before us. God, I pray, take this word and just multiply it like when you fed the 5,000. God, meet every need. Through your word this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 7, we're looking at verses 14 through 25. Uh, Last week, we just did an introduction. We didn't get into the text. We examined who is the wretched man of Romans 7, and there's much debate over this answer. It's not a simple answer. Um, I think I can be dogmatic. It's Paul. Uh, But is it Paul as writing about as an unbeliever under the law? Or is it Paul as a believer bearing his heart of the current battle of indwelling sin that the believer still fights? And after hundreds and hundreds of hours, I've been studying this thing for, uh, I think, 30 years now. It was one of the papers I wrote at seminary. I just, it, it's a passion of mine, and I've concluded uh, that there are problems with both views and beauties with both views. I get why it's debated. Uh, sometimes I study something of a great debate. When I'm done, I'm like, what's all the fuss? It just seems so clear. Uh, not so in Romans 7. And so we differ on our own elder board uh, as to how to interpret this section. We differ among members sitting here this morning, but we are absolutely unified on this. You are justified by faith in Christ alone. The penalty of sin has been broken by believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are in absolute agreement that in Romans 6, the dominion of sin has been broken. Romans 7, you have to die to the law and be married to Jesus in order to bear fruit for him under this new covenant. We agree that there's no perfectionism on this side of glory. It's not just pure victory with no battle. We all understand the battle with remaining sin. We agree that Christian life is not just a downward spiral of defeat, but it's grace changing us from one image of glory to the next. And we agree that as we see God clear and clear in the scriptures, our love for him grows and our desire for obedience grows and our realization of sin and how much it fights against us grows as well. And so we disagree as to whether Romans 7 is teaching that or not. And that is why we are lock shield walking together, laboring for your growth in Christ. But that is why some of your elders last week were like, poor Ken, he, he missed it again. Uh, I'm, sure he, uh, I'm sure he will grow. Um, and I'm like, I bet these guys are right in a lot of other areas. <laughs> so in, enjoy our blessed banter uh, that in no way affects the unity of the Spirit. And so let's uh, take a look this week. So my, my conclusion last week 
is I think that this is Paul writing as a believer, and I, I believe a mature believer as the Apostle Paul was. And this morning, I want to show you from the text the way a believer will battle sin this side of glory from justification to glorification. Uh, we're in a battle with sin. And by the providence of God, the couple of the elders who hold to it being an unbeliever had to be gone this morning. So I feel a little more blessed freedom in the pulpit. So may God bless his word this morning and bear much fruit. In Romans seven 14, let's pray. Father, I pray now open this word up to us for I, I found so much life in these verses and I pray now by your spirit that you would do the same in every believer sitting here this morning. God, I pray glorify yourself in these words. Amen. I want to set the context to drop this beautiful diamond in its context is important. We began in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation uh, for the Jew and then the Gentile for all who believe for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So we have a gospel where a God kind of righteousness is revealed for how we can be made right with him. So all human beings, then Paul moves in, fall short of the glory of God. We have self at the center reference now as we come into this world and we bring daily dishonor to God. Paul said, we've exchanged his glory for lesser things, for the image of an image. And we've chosen to worship something other than this God who's our creator. And Paul shows that because of that, we're all under his wrath. And I want you to hear this righteously. We are righteously under the wrath of God because God has given a creation that tells you there's a God. And he says, people just suppress it. He's given us a law that reveals what his will is for us. And he showed how we took that and sinned with it and beat people up with it and didn't obey it. The gospel is that God then has provided in Christ a way for fallen sinners to be made right with God again. I love that word justification, to, to be declared right before God. You're accepted, you're righteous, you're, you're in agreement with him now. He can forgive us. He can, can forgive us for all of our sins and still be just. He can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith because he punished his own son on a cross. If he did not do that, he couldn't just say, sin's forgiven. He can be just and forgive you. That is a beautiful truth. And he does it by Christ dying on a cross and the righteousness of a, a Christ who came, born under the law, and fulfilled it. And he says, this gospel is given by faith alone, not by the works of the law. It's for the empty hand that will hold it out and receive such a glorious gospel. And the question is, how can he do that? Well, God provided a righteousness that was acceptable to him. And it's not your own, but it's Jesus' righteousness. And by faith, he says, he imputes that to your account. God will actually treat you as if you live the life that Jesus lived. Romans 4, 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. And in Romans 3, 21, <coughs> Paul said, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So there's a new way, there's a new righteousness revealed, not law, but this righteousness of Christ who came and lived the perfect righteousness of Christ. Flip over to Romans 10. I'm going to give you a little preview of where we're going to be in two years. <laughs> we're speeding up, brother. <clears throat> Romans 10.3. This is just beautiful. So he's talking about the Jews here. And not knowing about God's righteousness. So it's that Greek structure again about a God kind of righteousness, the righteousness that he requires. They didn't understand a God kind of righteousness. And so they looked at the law and they seek, seeking to establish their own. I'm going to give the righteousness that the law requires. I'm going to work at it and be a good person. And so they would not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And they, they lowered it and they made all their rules and they, they had a false standard of themselves. And so they, they, 
they, they tried to get their own. Instead of submitting to a God kind of righteousness, I'll do it myself. Verse 4, for Christ is the fulfillment. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And this whole gospel then is to, to get us righteous, to be done with the law and our own kind of righteousness and to submit to God's that the only way you can be acceptable before him is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the way I get that put to my account is faith and not by me cleaning up and working at it and being a good person. That was the point of chapter 5. Adam was a representative head. His disobedience was imputed to all of us. We all come into the world with the stain of Adam, guilty, separated from God under sin and death. The second Adam came into the world. And his obedience now, his perfect righteousness was imputed to us. And we get righteousness and life now through Christ. Beautiful gospel. Does it bring with it any objections? We've seen two. We've seen the first one. Well, if, if sin increased when the law came and grace abounds and swallows it up, let, let's sin then that grace might abound. And Paul answered that in chapter 6. How can you who died to sin still live in it? Well, Paul, if you take us out from under law, we're just going to live any way we want. We're going to be lawless. And Paul answers that in chapter 7 by saying that you died to the law, that you might be married to another in order that you might bear fruit for God. And so there's a, this marriage to the law died, and now I'm married to Christ, and I'm accepted and loved, his righteousness, sins forgiven, and I will now bear fruit for the kingdom of God by being joined to Jesus Christ. And the question that we've been looking at then is, is the law bad then? Paul, is the law sin? Well, how could you say such a thing? And that was Romans 7, 7 through 13. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is the righteousness of God manifested. The law is not the problem. The problem is what it does when it comes to our sin. Sin is the problem. Sin is aroused and it's stirred up when the righteous law comes and commands truth. Uh, sin is like uh, the law comes and it's like a greenhouse and it just multiplies our sin. And so Romans 7, 6, <clears throat> but now we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound so that we might serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. That's the whole new covenant. The law is written in my heart. It's put in my mind. I'm out from under law. I'm married to Christ. So the question is, why does the Christian still sin? It just seems like the problem is solved. Well, partly. The theologians have divided us up into what we call already, not yet. And so we have been justified completely. We've been saved. We are right with God this morning if you have faith. The rule of sin, is it's been broken. Its dominion has been broken this morning for the believer. But the presence of sin and its remaining influence that's still in a believer is not yet. And what we're going to see this morning is it's coming. There's a day when the presence of sin will be taken away from all of us. But until glory, we are going to have the presence of sin, not reigning, but remaining. And so there's stages in redemptive history. And the last section was dealing with the stage of the not yet in the believer. This, this, uh, the, the, we're going to see that at the end of the chapter this morning, the removal of the not yet is coming. But we're all sitting here as believers in this battle. And so what I've seen over the last 30 years of ministry <clears throat> is sometimes just good Christians saying, you know what, pastor, uh, what, what you need with all the sin that is still in the church is just more law. We just got to give them more rules, tell them what to do. That, that, that's what most, we were, we're prone to run to that in the church. I, it, it's with your children. It's easier to slap law than to get this new covenant beautiful principle. Put, put them back under law. Paul, your teaching is what is wrong with the church. You're hurting them. You're getting them out from law. You get rid of law and you get lawlessness. No law is not the answer. Hear that. So Paul now in verse 14 in chapter 7, he turns to the present tense to take this on, what the not yet looks like. I want to define for you this morning, what is the not yet that's still going on in me as a Christian? And that the problem is not needing more external law. You don't need Moses to fix this. It's, it's written in your heart and your minds. And the problem is the same. 
Not in degree or control by sin, but it's the same. The new I that's been justified and has a new heart and a new mind. You know what my problem is this morning? Sin. <laughs> it's not gone. It's not raining, but my problem this morning is sin. It's, well, look at that foe that, that is still here. It's not annihilated. It's, it's an angry, dethroned monarch trying to regain its rightful, its, what it thinks is its rightful position. And you have insurgents within your body fighting against us even this morning. Some of you are fighting to even pay attention right now. Which one is it? <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of faces, not just one. The problem is not take this law out of my heart. It's killing me. Those are righteous and good and beautiful God-honoring desires that we have. That's not what's wrong. But what is wrong is the remaining rot that is still in your body. And that is where the battle is. And that is where we must fight, brothers and sisters. Many think the battle is out there. It's the world. It's the devil. We'll go away to monasteries to hide away and find that the battle is still in our own heart as Luther found out. And so what I want you to see this morning is the enemy is right here. It's right here. And so the more external law will not fix this, but the preaching of the glory and the beauties of Christ are what will begin. We'll see in chapter eight, how do we put to death remaining sin that we all have that will overpower and drive out the wrong desires of my heart that are created by remaining sin with the goodness of law and wanting me to give uh, my members to its service. And so I need the spirit showing me Christ to make any progress to, my, to what my new nature desires, which is what we call Christ-likeness. And so this is beautiful, what we look at this morning. Any questions? My bottom line is this. The law was unable to justify a person. And the law is unable to sanctify a person. Only the Holy Spirit can mortify this sin. And sanctification must be accomplished by the Holy Spirit of God. Our outline as we go through this morning is we're going to look at two truths to help battle sin as believers. In verses 14 through 23, we're going to look at our dilemma with sin. And then in verses 24 through 25, our deliverance from sin, the hope of it. So let's take a look. Um, as I've, I've worked this so many times and come up with so many outlines, I came across one um, by John MacArthur, and I'm going to just borrow it this morning because I have never found anything close to his outline that I like as much, certainly not mine. So we're going to borrow from him this morning of how he laid out this outline. And, and there's three laments that we're going to look at in this first section. And, and just three, three growing laments with remaining sin. This is the believer's heart towards sin. You're not at peace with it. You're at war with it. And I want you to see in verses 14 through 17, the first one, verses 18 through 20, the second one, and then verses 21 through 23, the third one. And under each of those sections, it, it just flows perfectly. Paul will state the problem, and, and then he's going to give you the symptoms of the problem, and then he'll give you the source of the problem. And he's just going to go boom, 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 boom. Every time, hopefully by the time you're done, you're like, I get it. I get this. So let's take a look at his first lament. Look with me in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage <coughs> to sin. There's the statement of the problem. And so it begins with, for we know. He used this back in Romans 3.19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. And so he's bringing his readership into this. The Christians in Rome is going to say, we know this. We know that the law is spiritual. The law came from God. The law is holy and righteous and good. I know it's, it's origin. It's, it's divine. It's, it's spiritual. So we, we know this, but I am a flesh I'm a flesh. And this is the, the question that we wrestled with last week. Am I, is that unsaved? Is Paul unsaved? And, and there's this nuance that I think is important that when Paul talks about being unsaved with this phraseology, he says, in the flesh. Look back at Romans 7, 5. This is talking about us as unbelievers. For while we were what? In the flesh, the sinful passions, you know, were aroused. And so it's always 
in the flesh to describe the unbeliever. And Romans 8.8, 8, he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And here, Paul says, I'm fleshy. The, the couple times I could find where Paul uses this phrase is it's speaking about believers acting sinfully. And so it's, it's this uh, flesh that I think we need to get our arms around is when you think of flesh, it's not just skin and bones. It's not just this stuff right here. Uh, sarx is the noun, uh, the form here. And so it can mean several things. Paul's, Paul is using this word sarx in a moral sense. It's that which is opposed to God. And that's going to really be explained in the rest of this section, what flesh does and how it opposes God in this moral sense. I, I had a professor in seminary who, harmardiology is the study of sin. And he called Romans 7 a harmardiological hangover. That's just beautiful. So we have a harmardiological hangover from being in Adam and the remains of sin. It's not raining, but there's a hangover that all of us are still battling. And so he's saying, Paul here, I have impulses contrary to the law of God, earthy. And so no longer am I in the flesh, but the flesh is still in me. I'm no longer in Adam, but Adam is still in me. The law is spiritual, but I'm, I'm fleshy. I've got flesh still in this body. And just one quick note, someone asked this last week. This isn't two natures. I got a good nature, bad nature, old man, new man, just battling and waging. I think this is important to, to clarify is that in Adam, you had a sin nature and it ruled you. And then it's the Paul says you died to that. And so that, that nature uh, that ruled and reigned died. <clears throat> he says, now you have a new nature. But, but this new nature has a principle of sin still within. So I'm going to call it a, a principle versus a nature. And so it's not called a nature. It, it, it's not a dual nature going on within each one of us, uh, but a controlling nature of a new creation that has insurgents within that fight against our new nature. That's the right way to think about this. Not, that was me. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't, that, that's not, it's not civil. It's not Jekyll and Hyde. I just want you to see that it's not two natures. There's a ruling nature for the believer in Christ, a new nature, and there's remaining sin. It's not a nature. That's for free. Verse 14 He's going to describe this a little bit. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm, I'm sarx. I'm of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. And this is more definition to explaining what does it mean to be fleshly. And this is the title for the argument that follows, as Paul now will flush out what he means by this statement. And I believe this to be a very experiential section. I think Paul is really opening up his heart and showing this, this experiential battle in the Christian life. And I think it shows Paul's sensitivity to sin is that he's disgusted with his sarks, his flesh. And in fact, in Romans 8, he's groaning to be rid of that remaining flesh for the redemption of his body. And so he used to think he was such a good little boy. And then you get saved and you see how wretched we really are, that we're rotten to the core and we're saved only by grace. And the slavery imagery now that Paul is kind of bringing back, I'll tell you right now, it's problematic to this view. Chapter 6 has spoke about emancipation. We were under slavery, and we have been emancipated from that slavery to sin. And is that now being thrown out again? Is Paul bringing in our shackles back in and putting them on us again? That's the question. I think it's the strongest argument for Paul being an unbeliever but here's why it hasn't persuaded me all the way over, is his reasoning here is last week, I told you I didn't like the historical present, that when he was preaching, writing in past tense, and in 14 through 25, he shifts to the present tense, and there's a thing called the historical present that is still talking past to, to emphasize. The, the other view um, doesn't like my explanation here, uh, I, think, I do believe it's, it's the weakest part of my argument. I'll, I'll humbly admit that. But I think this answer is quite rational, rational and possible. I, I think that what Paul's doing here is he's using a rhetorical device. He's showing us the realness and the intensity of this fight with remaining sin and black and white, black and white statements to make a point. 
a believer frustrated with the sin that remains and he's lamenting over it, which I believe every one of us should do. I think of the psalmist, he says, oh, he cries out, I am God forsaken. Uh, That was not true. Uh, It was how he felt. Sometimes a heart despairing under sin and its weight is not to be exegeted. It's to be understood. And so the Puritans would talk much about what they called bosom sins. And every one of us have some of these sins that we have a proclivity to, that we lean towards. And it just seems we, we fight and battle so much of our lives. And so temptation comes and I fall to it again. And at times, does it not feel that we are fleshly and sold into the bondage of sin? Uh, at times, it can certainly feel that way. And I've cried out like this more times than I care to share of this battle with sin. So my question to you, are there any differences between the two statements in chapter 6 and chapter 7? And this is what kind of helped me. I had this professor at seminary who I think he was the smartest man who ever lived. His name was George Zemeck. I think he had the whole Old Testament memorized in Hebrew. But I was listening to his teaching on this section and he, said, he brought out a real important exegetical point. Is in the, right here in verse 14, sold into bondage to sin. It's what we call a passive participle. And the passive is I'm, I'm being acted upon. And in Romans 6, when he talked about our bondage, it's an active. It's, it's more this, uh, we, we willingly and actively selling ourselves to sin that we were in Adam. Romans 6, 17 through 18, you actively presented yourself to sin. You just, you loved it. You gave yourself to it. It ties well with doulos, a willing bond slave of sin. But here in, in this passive participle is sin's taking me away from my deep and truest desires, what I love and long. I want to please God. I have the law in my heart and it's leading me away. And I think it's very crucial that he moves to the passive participle. That's my answer. Okay. I hope you like it. The rest of the passage will flush this out that the new eye that wants to do righteousness and do loss, but remaining flesh and sin carries me away to do that what I do not wish. Commentator Lenski said, don't make emancipation absolute and don't make sold absolute. Two chapters have different genres and different contexts. One's positional and one is experiential. And I just think that this is the, a good answer for this verse. So let's take a look then. The statement of the problem is the law is spiritual, but I'm fleshy. And now I want to look at the symptom of the problem then. What, what are the symptoms? What, what, what does that look like in verse 15? For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. So when you walk into the doctor and he says, what are your symptoms? You know, here, here, Paul, what are your symptoms? And Paul says, well, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm no longer what I was in Adam. I love my master. I'm joined to Christ. The law is written in my heart. The symptoms are I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. I want to commune with the living God. I want to I want to pray without ceasing 24-7. I want to trust God in everything. I want to obey with my mind, heart, affections, and will. I want to follow him with all of my being, but I just can't get it done perfectly. It seems that when I approach these spiritual desires, sin is most operative against me. So I can sit and watch a football game and my mind not drift for one quarter. And I can enter into prayer and all of a sudden, every little feather I want to start chasing. I want to love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I can't get it done. I like that saying is my reach will always exceed my grasp. I just want to be more holy. That's what I think is going on in Paul's heart. What would cause that? What would be the, our third point? What would be the source of that problem then, Paul? I, I see the symptoms, but what's the source And he'll answer that in verse 16. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells (coughs) in me. So wait a minute. I'm a new creation. I've been crucified with Christ. If I've been joined to him in holy matrimony and a due loss to Christ, what's the problem? Why do I have these symptoms? What? 
what's wrong with me? You ever ask that of yourself? What's wrong with me? And the answer is indwelling sin. Sin is no longer sovereign. Its dominion is broken. Its tyranny has ended. But it is not annihilated. It's, it's remaining. There is a hangover. And we are dealing with an with a, a angry, dethroned monarch. And it's constantly assaulting us. Our flesh is still subject to sin's deceit and is still attracted to many of its allurements. It's a foe that we will never be rid of entirely this side of glory till we get to, till we'll see at the end of this chapter. John Owen, the great Puritan says, sin needs no door to open. It's there. It lies in the mind, the will, the inclinations of our affections. It's intimate with our soul. It's, it's there. It doesn't need permission to come in. And as long as we are in these bodies, we'll always have sin fighting against our good desires. And I know some of you just think that's going to end one day. And because you have that battle, I, I can't be a Christian. I just want you to hear from Paul this morning. How about J.I. Packer? Packer says, sometimes a soul thinks or hopes that it may through grace be utterly free from this troublesome inmate. I just keep hoping I'll learn something, get to a place where this battle will go away. Upon some secret enjoyment of God, some full supply of grace, some return from wandering, some deep affliction, some thorough humiliation that the poor soul begins to hope that it shall now be freed from the law of sin. But after a while, sin acts again and makes good its old station. And so we must realize that this battle is lifelong so that you do not despair and quit battling. This truth serves to strengthen my fight every time I study it. I pray in your heart, all this does is strengthen your fight against sin. You will never get to the point of complete victory this side of glory. And what this could do for some of you this morning is big. Last week, it, it set many free. The enemy delights to dishearten and to discourage and even to spare the believer with his remaining sin, that he cannot be an object of grace with the desires for sin that are still within me. Let's turn to the second lament. And we're going to follow the same outline. Verse 18, statement of the problem. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. <clears throat> There's my problem. I got flesh. And then the symptoms of the problem. What does that mean, Paul? For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. And so I've got this battle going on, and I still love that illustration of an unskilled artist looking at this portrait, and for me it's Christ, and, and he's just getting more and more beautiful. And, and I just, I'm looking and I, I want to paint this portrait and I'm going to call this trying to live it out. And I'm just looking and there's nothing wrong with the, picture, the portrait, what I'm looking at, it's me. And I just can't get it done. And I just feel like my Christian life is I'm seeing it clearer and clearer. And I, I just can't get that Christ likeness all the way done. I, I, the problem is not the scene, it's me. The desire to obey will always be greater than your actual doing. And what is the source of that problem? He'll tell us again in verse 20. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But what is it then? It's sin which dwells in me. The sin is fighting me. That's what I'm battling on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you didn't get it, he's going to give you a third lament if you'll come with me to verse 21. I'm going to state the problem again. I think he wants us to get this. Do you think this is a real battle? I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. I want to do good. I want, I got this law in my heart. I want to obey God and please him, but there's, there's evil that's still present in me. Well, Paul, what do the symptoms look like? Verse 22, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I've been regenerated. I've got it written in my heart. I love the law. But I see a different law in the members of my body. 
waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. And I, I read too far. That's the source of the problem as well. The, what's the source of the problem? The sin, the sin that dwells within me. And so what I want you to see then is that the statement of the problem is, is I, I, I have flesh. There, there's a new nature and there's flesh that's fighting me. The symptoms, the things I want to do, I'm not. The things I hate, I'm doing. The source of the problem again and again is my indwelling sin that I still have as a believer in Jesus Christ. So my question for you this morning, and you can yell out the answer if you want. Why would God then leave remaining sin in an unbeliever? I mean, isn't that the problem with the church of God? Like if we had no sin this morning, wouldn't this be a much better assembly? <laughs> Instead of sinner saints? Why, why would... God in his perfect wisdom leave indwelling sin in the believer until he gets to glory. Yeah. For his glory. But what he said there is so that we'd have to be dependent on him. Thank you, Eric. I think that's the answer is humility. Humility is it that we, we would just be so dependent on him and the Holy Spirit and grace and Christ. Um, could you imagine how many of us are prideful with remaining sin? <laughs> Take it away? Oh, maybe, we, I guess we wouldn't be prideful if you took it away. It keeps us humble. And, and I believe that God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so what Romans 7 does for me is it, it keeps me in a broken state before my God, looking to him and him alone. The just shall live by faith. I think it, it makes us on a daily basis that my acceptance with God is never going to be my own righteousness. So it just leaves me at the foot of the gospel on a daily basis that the only way I can be acceptable to God is through the righteousness that he gives me in Jesus Christ. Romans 7 has taken away all my hope of looking at me. I have, I have nothing to look at. And so my hope is in this beautiful gospel that I try to preach to you week in and week out because that's your hope. And so I pray with all of you in your fight with sin this morning that if you're looking at yourself and your performance saying, I, I think God hates me, there's no hope for me, I want you to look again to this Christ who gives you a perfect righteousness and it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will not fade or diminish. What a gift. What a gift. And also I think it's for the next part of this passage. If, if we were just saved, justified, and then taken to heaven, which the thief on the cross got that privilege. Or if you're, if you're saved and there's just no more battle with sin, I think we would miss out on something sweet and beautiful. <clears throat> and that's the day when we get the not yet. I think that God has designed this season of us groaning and battling under remaining sin for that day when the not yet comes and we are delivered from this battle. The day when even the presence of sin is taken away. Without this battle, none of us would be groaning for the redemption of our bodies. And I pray every believer in this room is groaning for the redemption of your body. God, I want to be done with this remaining rot that is destroying and fighting and beating on me daily. I think we would try to make Denver paradise and be very content here. Amen? Back to our text. Verse 24. And if three laments were not enough. <laughs> we're going to have one last one. And this is this cry that I just think exceeds all of them in intensity. Any of you ever have a baby? Kelly, do you remember? Like, have you ever heard something called transition? I never did till the first baby. And there's something called transition for those of you who are ignorant like I was. Um, when, they're, when they're laboring, there's this point called transition when it just goes to a whole other level. And that's to get you ready to deliver the baby. And when that hits, you know, you want an epidural or leave the room if you're a husband. <laughs> <clears throat> and it is, it is a, an intensity. And I just think Paul's now going to hit his transition. And this is now the, the cry of this man's heart as deep as this lament can get. 
<laughs> and I, I believe that every child of God has at some point in the secret place cried this out uh, for some of us daily. And I want you to listen then to verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? This is what's called a nominative of exclamation. This form of the noun here, wretched man that I am, it's used without a verb to bring about a greater stress on the subject. And it's to emphasis on the subject, which is what? Wretched man. Oh, wretched man that I am. The one who sees the chasm of what we want to be and what we are. And he sees the grace of God. You, you see the beauties of everything we've seen in Romans. And the response, we're giving a 10 cent response. You see the beauty of Christ and the sin that so easily entangles us. I see the best bridegroom in my unfaithfulness to him. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Who will deliver me? That Greek word was used to describe a soldier who ran to his comrade in the midst of battle to rescue him from the enemy. I'm in battle. I'm lying here dying. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? <laughs> Who's going to help this mess? And what I've just described, this body is where sin manifests itself as its instrument. And there's this remaining sin that's causing me to use my eyes and my mind and my feet and my hands for sin. God, who's going to set me free from this? I read a commentator this week who makes the analogy of what Paul could be thinking. He said near Tarsus, where Paul was born, there was a tribe of people who inflicted the most unbelievable punishment on a murderer. They would take the body of the victim and tie it behind hand to hand, head to head, shoulder to shoulder, and they would have to carry that body around until rigor mortis would set in. And he said, I wonder if Paul has this in mind, oh, wretched man that I am, set me free from the body of this death that's fighting against the newness of who I am and what God has made me. And I want you to hear the hope for, for uh, both views. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray that no one says, thanks be to my effort. Thanks be to my church. Thanks be to my baptism. I pray that as we look at this, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This battle that we live in and we fight as a believer because we hate sin so much there's this, this uh, verse that's always jumped out at me in Thessalonians. And Paul says he's going to come one day and he's going to give relief to those who are afflicted. And the Greek word for relief is the word anison. And it referred to a, a bow and arrow that was really taut. And so I just want you to picture it. And it meant to come and snip the bow. And when you snip the bow, it just goes. <laughs> and I, he's saying he's going to come and he's going to snip your bowstring. And all of you who have this new nature that just wants to please God and you're battling sin day to day. All the things that you're going through, the afflictions, the trials, thanks be to God, he's going to come one day and snip your bowstring and you're going to get anison for all of eternity. That's the hope of the believer. Praise be to God. There's no other way out from this. It's not a secret discovery or one day you just figure something. It, it's going to be Christ snipping your bowstring and you're going to be released from this battle. That's why I love when the ones I love and know Christ pass on. They snip the bowstring and the battle's over. And this is the sanctifying hope of the believer in Christ. This hope purifies us and it keeps giving us growth and victory. And it's essential that we live into this hope that we're going to be saved from sin's presence. One day, as much as I'm justified this morning, as much as sin has lost its dominion over me, I can be absolutely certain one day I will have no more sin saved from its presence. The battle will end. Can you even imagine? One songwriter said, I can only imagine. <laughs> what will it be like? And then we'll close out in verse 25b, why I hold to this stance so much. You're delivered. Christ sets you free. What does that look like now for the believer? So then, so then, here's my life between justification and glorification. 
So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. I want to please him. I want to love God and love others. But on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. And so until that day when Christ comes back or we die, this battle is going to rage. We're to put on the full armor of God and we're to fight until we go home. So this is the expression of realism. This battle is the sign of life, not death. Romans 8, my dear brothers and sisters, we're going to learn how by the Spirit you can put to death these insurgents within your own body. And I want you to hear the goodness of God. You will never be able to do it in your own strength. And you're going to learn that a hundred times over again in this Christian life. There's only, it says, put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. And it is only through the Holy Spirit that we can put these things to death. But we will be. We will be. And I've said last week, as Paul was a growing, maturing man in Christ by the Spirit, he was putting to death. And I pray that every one of you this morning can say, by the Spirit of God, I'm putting to death the deeds of the flesh. I am growing into the image of of Christ. Application. I'm going to make them quick. This is not a get out of jail free card. (laughs) If you run out of here saying, oh, this is such good news. There's no need to fight. (laughs) Everyone has this problem. Let's, Let's go, man. Come over to my house for parties tonight. You missed it. It's the same answer to Romans 6 and 7. Should we sin that grace might abound? How can you die to sin still live in it? Well, without law, we're going to be lawless. No, you're going to be married to Christ and you're going to bear fruit for him. Romans 7 is the same thing. It's a call to fight. It's a call to fight. How? By being married to Christ. By not giving your members to sin, as we saw in Romans 6.12. It has no members of its own. By the Spirit of God, through his word, show me Jesus Christ. Give me greater desires for him than for my sin. Affections for him will drive out these wrong desires that these insurgents are stirring up in our own hearts. So if your understanding of Romans 7 makes you feel free to sin now, you just missed it again. (laughs) That isn't what you should come out of here with. If you do, something's wrong and we need to meet and talk. It should not have produced that in your heart, but it should say, I am free to fight and hope. This has energized me because I'm not the only one. This is normative. I am done feeling defeated onward and upward by the grace of God. I will fight until God says done. And I pray that he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. You will never quit fighting sin by the grace of God. And what an encouragement to know that I have sin to fight. And that doesn't mean something's wrong with me. It means something's right with me. And I want you to walk away with encouragement that this side of glory, the battle must be fought. There's no coasting. There's no seasons off. It doesn't get lighter. I just want you to set your mind because of the glory of Christ, that that path that's set before you to run is is fighting sin until he delivers me from it forever. Secondly, how do I think about all this? I think about Romans 1 through 5. And I... I think about Christ's righteousness daily, and I, and I try not to live by my ups and downs. I try not to live when, man, I'm doing, I feel like I'm really doing well, or when I just feel like I'm failing on a constant basis. I, I have to live into the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's my anchor, and that's my hope. Don't, don't throw away Romans 1 through 5. That's our, that's our pillow. That's our foundation. And then I come to Romans 8, And Paul's going to lead us to that there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I want you to hear this. Not even sin, not even lost battles. By the grace of God, you will win the war. And I I think that's the greatest hope and encouragement you can have as you're fighting day in and day out, that it's God's fight and he will win. As, As your bowstring will get snipped. And so don't you love fighting battles that you know you're going to win? I love those kind. (laughs) Those are my favorite kind of fights. That's why I always picked on little kids. No, just kidding. (laughs) So what we see is that we fight until we breathe our last. The battle does not end until Christ returns. But it helps us to battle to know this. And so please hear this. There's a growing chasm of what you know to do. And so as we're learning God's word and growing in it, 
you're learning more and more what God requires of you and who He is. And, and as you're learning that, uh, it, what you do uh, lags behind. And so this is with James. Don't just be hearers of the word and not doers. Is that this chasm that's growing is there, there's something that needs to happen as it grows. And I've had seasons where it just grew and all it did was cause me to despair. And what this is telling us this morning then is as that's growing and you're seeing it, look to Christ. And what should be happening in every believer's life is I'm growing in my love for Christ because I'm realizing more and more how awesome God is and how sinful I am. And so there's this, this remedy is, is I knew it when I got saved, but now I know it. My, my only hope as I stand here this morning is the work of Jesus Christ. And so I, as, you, as you're fighting this battle and you're realizing more and more the depth of pride and selfishness and all these things that you're battling, how many are you you're learning the word and you're, you're ending there and you're not going out and serving widows and orphans and caring about others? And so you just, there's a million ways you can miss this. And you're just growing and seeing what I'm not doing and what I should be doing and what I am. And I just pray that we treasure Christ because he is the only answer. And he's our only hope and our only acceptance and that we never let go of him. And that will empower us to fight and how to mortify. That's going to be the foundation in Romans 8 that we're going to look at. So I pray that you are growing in your love to Christ because you need him so bad. If you leave him behind in your Christian life, you're going to nosedive real quickly. And so I love that God designed. Why do you leave indwelling sin? Because I can't, I can't get away from Christ for two minutes. I can't leave him. And so I, I love that I'm so dependent on Christ, I can't run away. And every time I do, I will know, because I, I, I nosedive. And so I pray that we would treasure Christ, abide in him, look to him, believe in him, and hope in him. And in that, we will become like him. And so I pray this morning that your hearts may, may be set free with this battle that we're all in. And, and I like that we're going to do membership now because we need each other with this kind of power. So it doesn't rain, but it remains and it's nasty. And we need each other if we're gonna make it to glory. I'll shut up, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this open heart of Paul. I thank you for him bringing us into his heart and showing us this battle. God, I pray that every believer would be refreshed and encouraged that what's going on in their battle is not death, but life. The enemy will come every time and bring the accusation, your righteousness is not enough, and we'll wallow and we'll de despair, but the answer is my righteousness is seated at the right hand of God. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room who's a believer would, would be encouraged to battle, to fight, and to know that you have given us means and ways to fight this traitor that is within our own bodies. And so, God, I pray, I, we look to you and to you alone. By the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, would you put to death the remains of sin that are still within us. God, we thank you for the hope of glory, and we pray that Christ would come back today and snip the bowstring. I want to watch every one of these bowstrings snipped. How sweet this will be to enter into glory from have Anison for all of eternity because we fought so hard together. For, for your name's sake and for our holiness in each other's. God, thank you for this gift of salvation and the body of Christ. Amen.